Paul Dennis Reed is one of the most evil and depraved serial killers in United States history, who tortured his own grandmother and killed seven people. Today, we're taking a journey to Nashville, Tennessee in 1997 to document a series of vicious fast food robberies done by a very disturbed individual who had a long history of crime under his belt. On November 12th, 1957, Paul Dennis Reed was born at a Fort Worth hospital in Texas. When he was three years old, his mother filed for divorce to escape his father, who was an abusive and raging alcoholic. Paul spent his early childhood being raised by his paternal grandmother. Unfortunately for her, Paul's behaviour wasn't much different from his father. He would torment her every day by putting tacks in her food, spraying her with a garden hose when they were outside, or barricading her in her own room. When he was still a young child, he was already completely out of control, and no one could get him to calm down. The final straw was when he was at the age of eight. He tried setting his grandmother on fire while she was sleeping. Deciding that she couldn't raise him any longer, she sent him to a home for boys, and he would also bounce around between living with his mom and dad. When Paul was a teenager, he attempted to sexually assault both his sister and mom, causing him to get kicked out of his mom's house. He went to live with his father, and when he attempted to assault his other sister, he got kicked out of his father's house as well. Now, with nowhere to go, Paul began stealing and manipulating people while he bounced between living in group homes and the streets as a 16-year-old. He ended up being arrested for auto theft and was put on three years of probation, but this didn't stop him. He instead began committing more and more crimes. It was all he had ever known. Throughout his early adult life, he was arrested numerous times for robberies as well as check fraud and auto theft. But his early life of crime would reach its climax when in 1984, at the age of 27, he stormed into a Houston steakhouse with a gun and began making demands to the employees for money. The police were called before anyone got hurt and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for aggravated armed robbery. However, in 1990, he was released on parole from prison after only seven years, due to the prisons in Texas being too crowded. For the first time in his life, it seemed like things were going in the right direction, when he landed a job as a truck driver that paid well. Even more surprisingly, he was able to hold the job down and not break the law for the time he worked there. But unfortunately, his time as a trucker didn't last for long because after only a few months, he got into a horrific accident that gave him multiple injuries. He got $25,000 settlement and two years worth of workman's compensation. Now that he was jobless and had a big pile of cash, Paul devoted his life to a completely new passion. He wanted to become a country western music singer. He spent most of his settlement on plastic surgery to look more photogenic. He got a skin peel, had his ears tucked back, and got his teeth straightened out. Although his new goals weren't as realistic as being a truck driver, as he had never touched any instruments or sang before, at least they were harmless now. In 1995, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and began taking music lessons. He was under a fake name of Justin Parks, and told almost everyone he knew that he was the next Garth Brooks. While he worked on his career as a musician on the side, he got a job at a place called Shoney Restaurant in the metropolitan area as a cook. And this is when the city of Nashville would be shaken by a terrifying series of events. On Sunday, February the 16th, 1997, the store owner of Captain D's Restaurant on Lebanon Street arrived after 10 a.m expecting the place to be alive and full of customers, as it usually is on a busy Sunday. But when he approached the front door, he noticed 
that the lights were on. But aside from that, the store was left untouched. The chairs were still up, and the door was locked. It looked as though someone had been in there, but no one had arrived to set up for the day. It usually opened at 10am sharp, so the owner was quite unnerved. He went to a different store down the street and called the phone inside the restaurant multiple times. But he got no answer. He began to feel nervous that something serious had gone wrong, so he called one of his employee's fathers, who was a police officer. A Nashville police patrol came by and they began figuring out how to get into the store. That morning, there were supposed to be two people there to open it up. One of them was 16-year-old Sarah Jackson. She was regarded as a popular student with good grades at her school. She participated in many sports and extracurriculars and was working part-time at Captain D's so she could afford university. When the police entered Captain D's restaurant, they found Sarah Jackson lying face down with two gunshot wounds in the back of her head in the cooler. Her manager, Steve Hampton, was lying next to her with three bullets in his head. Apart from that, the police noticed that the restaurant's safe had been opened and that Steve's wallet was missing. They estimated that $7,600 disappeared from the restaurant. There were no fingerprints or footprints left behind and no witnesses. The cops knew that they were dealing with a highly skilled criminal who had experience and they had no leads whatsoever. The story made the news, but the case quickly reached a dead end. On the evening of March 23rd the same year, four employees, Jose Antonio Ramirez Gonzalez, 17-year-old Andrea Brown, 27-year-old Ronald Santiago, and Robert A. Sewell, were walking out of the side door of a McDonald's restaurant on Lebanon Road after packing up for the night. Before the last person out locked the door, a man with a gun approached them and herded them back into the restaurant. He forced them into an office in the back and had one of them open the safe and cash registers for him. He took $2,300 from the safe and $3,000 from the register, then came back to the office and shot three of the employees in the back of the head. His gun failed when he attempted to kill Jose Gonzalez. Jose stood up and knocked the gun out of his hands. The robber wasn't strong enough to control Jose, so he grabbed a knife from the kitchen and stabbed Jose 17 times in the chest, then fled the scene with the money. When emergency responders arrived at the scene, Jose was still alive, but not responding. He was brought to a hospital where surgeons desperately worked through the night, trying to save his life. They were successful, and Jose was able to give information away about what the attacker looked like. Police drew a sketch of the man's face and released it to the public, but again, no viable fingerprints or footprints were found at the scene. In the large metropolitan area of Nashville, it would be very difficult to find a suspect based on a sketch alone. This case as well went cold. But police were certain that the Captain D's robbery and the McDonald's robbery were done by the same person because of how similar both robberies were executed. While the search for the suspect of the two robberies continued, another robbery happened. This time, it was at a Baskin Robbins on Wilma Rudolph Boulevard in Nashville. On the evening of April 23rd, Angela Holmes, 21, who was a wife, mother, and manager of the store, was packing up for the night with just one other employee, 16-year-old Michelle Mace. Michelle's brother Craig arrived to pick her up. He pulled slowly into the parking lot and sat there for 15 minutes. But despite the fact that the lights were off in the store, his sister didn't come out, and it didn't look like there was anyone inside either. With a growing suspicion and uneasy feeling, Craig got out of his car and approached the front door. Despite the fact that the door was locked, he somehow managed to get inside and got a very eerie feeling when he did. 
He called out Michelle's name, but got no response. With a growing sense of panic, Craig sprinted out of the store and dialed 911. When police arrived on the scene, the store was in the exact same condition as the McDonald's and Captain D's robberies. The store's safe had been opened with $1,200 removed from it, but Michelle and Angela were nowhere to be found. The videotape from the camera had also been taken, but this time there was a bit more evidence. The police had three viable fingerprints as well as shoe prints. The next morning, a man walking his dog at Dunbar Cave State Park made a grisly discovery. His dog began barking at the shallow waters of Swan Lake, and when the man approached the shore, he found a body lying face down in the water. He called the police, and investigators arrived at a disturbing sight. The woman had her hands bound behind her back with a Baskin Robbins apron, and her throat had been slashed. The police searched the surrounding area and lake, and in the forest of Dunbar Park, they found another body in the exact same condition. They identified the woman in the lake as Angela Holmes, and the one in the forest as Michelle Mace. Now, a full-fledged operation began to make sure they could catch the killer if they ever attempted any more robberies. Armed, undercover police officers began working at restaurants so they could be ready to defend the restaurant in case of a break-in. Patrol vehicles changed their routes so that they would circle specific restaurants in the area. Weeks passed. The killer didn't take the bait and no progress was made on finding their identity. But on the night of June 1st, over a month after the Baskin Robbins break-in, something drastic would happen that would change everything for the investigation. 45-year-old Mitchell Roberts was the manager of a Shoney restaurant in Nashville. While he was sitting in his living room with his son, someone knocked on his front door. When he opened it up, the person standing on his porch was none other than Paul Dennis Reed. Paul had been working at the restaurant since he came to Nashville, but on February 27th, Mitchell fired him only 11 days after the Captain D robbery. When he asked Paul why he was at his doorstep, Paul began begging for his old job back. Mitchell told Paul that he couldn't tire him back, then made a naive mistake. He walked Paul back to his car, and when he was far enough away from the house, Paul pulled a gun on him and told Mitchell to get in his car. Mitchell acted quickly and sprinted back to his porch. Paul followed, carrying a knife. The gun wasn't loaded. They fought each other on the porch and Mitchell slammed the door in Paul's face. Paul sped away in his vehicle and Mitchell immediately dialed 911. The police showed up at Mitchell's house and he recounted the story to them. That's when something even more strange happened. The phone rang, and when Mitchell picked it up, it was Paul profusely apologising for what happened. The police told Mitchell to coax Paul into coming back, which he did. When Paul arrived at the house, the police were waiting for him, and he experienced the familiar feeling of being arrested. He was taken to the police station and charged for the assault of his former boss. But Mitchell wasn't satisfied. He somehow had the intuition that Paul was the fast food killer. He urged the police to file more severe charges. The police decided to compare Paul's fingerprints to the ones found in the Baskin Robbins murder, and they unsurprisingly were a perfect match. Police also reached out to Jose Gonzalez, the sole survivor of the McDonald's attack, and out of 300 pictures that looked similar to the sketch, he picked Paul Reed's face as the perpetrator of the attack. As for the Captain D's robbery, police revisited it and found fingerprints on Steve Hampton's movie card that matched Paul's. 
And so, it seemed like it was all over for Paul. The police obtained a warrant to search his apartment and found jugs of thousands of dollars in coins and bills. Paul's shoe prints matched the ones from the Baskin Robbins break-in. And as a final nail in the coffin, fibers taken from the back seat of Paul's car matched the fibers found on Angela Holmes and Michelle Mays' clothing, proving that Paul was the one who disposed of their bodies. Police still wanted a confession out of Paul, but after a grueling eight hour long interrogation, he didn't break. He assuredly denied his involvement in the crimes. Over a year and a half went by as the state prosecutors built their case against Paul. He spent 13 months on trial and they were seeking the death penalty for all three of his robberies. The prosecutors presented his criminal history as well as the fact that he was in debt and had used money stolen from Captain D's robbery as a down payment on his car. But Jose Gonzalez was the most important part of the trial. The hero who chose to take the stand against Paul Reed and recount his traumatic events. Paul Reed's defense team never used any witnesses to aid their defense. Instead, they tried to provoke sympathy among the jury. They insisted that Paul suffered brain injuries throughout his life. And as a result, the brain damage he injured caused him to have paranoid schizophrenia. This went along with a charade of mental illness where Paul would ramble on about how he was part of a government mind control project and that his attorneys were actors that were secretly against him. His sister also testified that he was mentally unable to stand trial due to his erratic, unpredictable behavior. The only problem with all of these arguments is that they completely fall apart when you consider that Paul Reed was able to premeditate all of his murders, as well as the fact that he was never diagnosed with schizophrenia he knew where the safe to the store was, as well as how to avoid leaving fingerprints and footprints, as well as how to take the security tapes out to hide evidence he was there. Ultimately, his facade didn't sway the jury into a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, and he was convicted on seven counts of murder and given a death sentence for each one. Paul Reed spent several years appealing all of his convictions, but in a strange turn of events, he sent a letter to his attorney in 2003, saying that he wanted to drop all appeals of his death sentence. In October 2013, Paul Reed was hospitalized for pneumonia, and on November 1st, 12 days before his 56th birthday, he died of medical complications on his hospital bed putting an end to one of the worst serial killers in America's history. It seemed like from a young age, Paul Dennis Reed was predisposed to be an evil person. What kind of an eight-year-old would try setting his own grandmother on fire? Maybe if he had gotten help before he was an adult, he would have been fine. Remember to like and subscribe. Good night.